I, I've never been interviewed in a car before. I know. <laughs> this is one of the crazier ways that I've done this. But uh, everybody, uh, welcome to the 82nd episode of Stories of Service, Ordinary People Who Do Extraordinary Work. And I am the host of Stories of Service, Teresa Carpenter. And as you'll see, this is one of my more unique uh, live recordings. Um, you'll, I was on my way down to London, and I was going to set up in this beautiful backdrop with a park picked out and all those kinds of things. And then life got in the way, and the tube station took a vote in, in what was going on. There's lots of delays here in the UK. So uh, I am currently in a car conducting an interview with my wonderful husband by my side uh, re uh, with the phone up so that he can read the bio and then we're going to get right started into some of the questions. So we adapt and we overcome in life. That is what we do. Right, Laura? Yeah, that's absolutely true. It's required. It's a requirement. Absolutely. So how are you doing tonight? I'm actually good. I'm actually really good. And I have not been great of late, but I, I'm feeling very good at this moment. And that's awesome. all we have, right, is this moment. Exactly. Absolutely. You never know what's going to happen when the next day is going to come. And so you just make the best of every situation. But I'm going to go ahead right now and read you guys a little bit about Laura. I've admired her work for so many months. And now I'm actually getting a chance to interview her. So it's... Teresa, you're frozen. Do you know that? Maybe I'm live by myself. <laughs> I could read my own bio. Ah, here we are. Sorry about that. She has profoundly changed how I see myself and my relationship with my mother. Her insight into relationships, love, and storytelling are ground people, groundbreaking. She gives people the language to help themselves process pain and move forward. And I'm so pleased to have on such a trailblazer, an impactful person within the space of hope and healing. And I also hope her insights can help guide you on where and how you want to share your story. She is the author of The Burning Light of Two Stars, The Courage to Heal, and four other groundbreaking books. In addition to writing those books that inspire, the work of her heart is to teach. And for more than 20 years, she's helped people find their voices, tell their stories, and hone their craft. She has been published in Publishers Weekly, Writer's Digest, Crime Reads, Brevity, and the New York Times. She's been featured in the Los Angeles Review of Books and on QWERTY, Right Minded, The Only One in the Room, and dozens of other podcasts. She is a featured speaker for the National Association of Memoir Writers and a popular craft teacher at the San Manuel Writers Conference. She leads an annual retreat on writing as a pathway through grief this August and will be taking a lucky group of writers. I did take a look at that. That looks amazing to the Tuscany in May, and you can join her. And learn more about her workshops and read the first chapters of her memoir at lauradavis.net. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for such a wonderful welcome. Thank you. Well, first off, I want to start with just a little bit about you. Uh, where are you from? And a little bit about sort of what it was like for you growing up. Uh, I, I grew up in New Jersey, um, a town called Long Branch, which was on the Jersey Shore. Uh, I grew up in a middle class, lower working working to middle class family. My my father was a teacher, a school teacher. He taught music. He was kind of an itinerant band teacher. Uh, my mother was um, uh, she was a nursery school for a while. She was just a stay at home teacher, stay at home mom. She was an actor. She was very active in community theater. That was really important for her. And then when I got a little bit older, my parents divorced. They were like the first ones to divorce in the, our whole circle. Uh, my dad dropped out of uh, his life to become a hippie in California. Yeah. Yeah. Took a lot of acid um, you know, and be, founded an artist colony. Um, and I was left with my mother who uh, was uh, devastated and also incredibly difficult for me to live with. And so, you know, at that point it was just the two of us. Um, I was also, you know, I think there are a few things that shaped me uh, in my young life. One is I was um, a preemie. I was born two pounds, 12 ounces. I had an identical twin sister who died. And I think that that, that early loss, immediate loss, being born into grief basically has influenced my whole life and my whole, the wiring of my nervous system is, is really bent on survival. So I, I started out that way. And then uh, when I was a few years old, my mother's father, my grandfather, actually abused me. So kind of layered on top of that first experience of trauma was 
And then and then just having an incredible wanted to basically rule my life and control everything about me and, and couldn't handle it as I started to develop into a strong independent personality. So she and I had uh, many, many years of war between us. That's the story I tell in, in my memoir is, is the story of this very tumultuous relationship. And, uh, my birth was that. And I think that your story is so relatable because I think that there's a lot of people who don't get that perfect start to their childhood. <laughs> perfect oh, I'm sorry. Great. Yeah. Far from it. <laughs> right. And yeah. I mean, I'm, a, I'm adopted myself and I had a very uh, tumultuous uh, relationship with my mother. And what I love about your work is that you, you see the gray. You're, you're not in this black and white world with how you tell the story. And I want to know a little bit about how you moved on from this very distant relationship to just being able to go to that place where you could accept what was going on and still have, and still have that bond. I, you know, it's an incredibly complicated answer and uh, it's a process that took many decades and I've written a lot about estrangement and the possibility of reconciliation, which I, I want to say right off is not always possible. There are some relationships where the very best thing is to walk away because the person is just too toxic um, and it's it's too devastating for us psychologically to stay embroiled with that person. So I'm not a fan of like everybody should do what I did. Um, but in right. my case, um, my mother and I had some positive qualities and she had some great qualities but she was incredibly difficult especially as a mother um, and I think the first thing I had to do was separate from her you know it's kind of a little bit ironic but I mean before there was any possibility of us ever reconciling with, with each other um, I had to break away from her because I in my young life you know probably into my 20s uh, yeah definitely into my 20s I would say that Everything I did was in response to her. You know, it was either because I was enmeshed with her, because I was trying to break away from her, because I was reacting to her, um, because I hated her, mm -hmm. and that I loved her, but <laughs> bound to her. You know, I mean, we were just so tied together. And um, the way I had been, you know, she related to me was was basically to say a lot of times things like, I know you better than you know yourself. And I know how you're feeling. That's not, that never happened. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of gaslighting. And yeah. so it took me a long time to begin to believe in myself and to trust my own perceptions, to even know I had a feeling inside my body. You know, I was just, I was a numb doer. You know, that's how I coped. Um, and so it, you know, I had to do a lot of therapy and I also had to really, create a break from her, a mm -hmm. pretty intense, serious uh, break so that I could start to find out who I was separate from this very enmeshed relationship. Um, and, and that went on for a number of years, that separation. Um, and I would call it, you know, you could say it was an estrangement and it was, but it also was a healing separation. Mm -hmm. And it was during that time that I began to you know, do the kind of inner work to actually develop a self that I had, I had, I, you know, I was broken. And it, it took many years for me to piece together those broken parts and create a foundation from which I can, I was able to form a viable adult life. You know, like I was, I was able to, you know, I've been in the same relationship for 30 something years. I've raised three children who are whole you know, and mm -hmm. have yeah. kind of four that I didn't get to have as a child. And I've, you know, I've had a, a meaningful career that has, that has touched really tens of thousands of lives. So there's all those things came from taking the time to separate and to do my own inner healing work first. You know, it's just, we can't get away from, you know, the, the trauma we've experienced, we can't get away from our history. We have to, we have to face it and use it as a portal for growth. And 
you know, that's, it's a very challenging thing to do. And it's still, I started off the interview by saying I've been having a hard time lately because these cycles of growth don't just, we don't just like get there and then that's, you know, it cycles through. And for me right now, you know, I'm aging, I'm getting older and I'm feeling more vulnerable. And in that vulnerability and some of the changes that I'm going through, some of these old core issues are resurfacing and I'm having to um, welcome them again. <laughs> I welcome love the them way you say it. Instead of like, I'm pushing all this away. <laughs> I'm just going to tough it out. I can't tough it out anymore. You know, I, mm -hmm. I think for a lot of my life, I was able to just like push through things. I have an incredibly strong will. Um, and I can't just push through anymore. You know, it's, it's, there's a, a different kind of vulnerability that I'm experiencing kind of psychically and emotionally. And it's requiring me to be very kind and tender to myself. And it's not, that's not natural for me. It takes, um, it takes conscious effort and a lot of meditation practice, a lot of therapy, a lot of, a lot of support. Um, and at the same time, I'm just still living my life as a leader, a teacher. Uh, it's like, there's things happening on, there's the external life and all the things I create and bring into the world and the ways I serve others. And there's also my own healing process, which continues. Yeah. There's a gift that you're just giving so many people, Laura, because as I read your book and you described the dynamic that you had with your mother, this on and off again, kind of relationship that is just, you can't put your finger on it because there's these moments, even with my own mother, where I feel so amazingly close to her in the moment. And then this like a switch comes off and it's like, I don't even have that same parental figure anymore. And as I grow in my healing and in where I'm at with this issue, it's made me realize that I've got to get at the root of some of these issues and not default to the same patterns. Um, I, I, I tend to be very untrusting. I tend to be very, um, suspicious of people's motives and other things. And I know a lot of that is just coming from that trauma and it's the trauma speaking and not the current situation that I'm in. So my question for you is how do you handle that? How do you say, okay, this is something that I'm reliving. That's part of my past. This is not applicable to the current situation. How have you learned to recognize that? Well, I, I think it's actually challenging to recognize it because when you're when you're in, you know, what's called a, a limbic hijack, you know, and the survival parts of our brain are lit up, we can't tell the difference between the past and the present. You know, we're, we're flooded with that need to, it's that flight, fight, freeze uh, uh -huh. that we get triggered into. And the, our, our rational self or our <laughs> witnessing self is like completely unavailable. Um, you know, sometimes I've been lately, I've been doing something which is actually quite sweet. Sometimes I just like, I just put my hands on my heart and I just say, sweetheart, you're going to be okay. Just, just that simple nurturing of the self. Um, and the, the mantra that I've been using, I, you know, for the last, I don't know, six months or so. And I say this to myself every day and it's, you are enough, you do enough, you have enough. Mm, that's powerful. I'm very hard from believing that that's true. You, love enough, you do enough. You are enough. I mean, if we believe that in the depth of our soul, what kind of liberation would that bring us? And I agree. Freedom, you know, so I, I want to have that freedom for the rest of my life. I don't want to be, you know, trapped on the wheel of, you know, compulsive behavior or working too much or uh, anxiety or you know being just caught up in the trance of uh -huh. doing busyness and uh, and and you know I, I was listening to a podcast the other day with Tara Brock who is one of my um, favorite go-to meditation teachers and um, she she just talked about the fact that it's not that we live in a PTSD society you know, it's it's not personal. These these things that challenge us in such a deep way, we could say, "Oh, it's my problem. I'm so screwed up." And then we add this layer of shame on top of what we're struggling with on an emotional or psychic or spiritual basis, um, and we we 
we trash ourselves like, oh my God, I'm so screwed up. Why do I, f but actually it's, it's so in the culture and you, you, anywhere you look, you, you turn on the podcast, you turn on the news, you anywhere we're bombarded with terrible news um, of a very crazy, damaged, uncertain world. And we are all impacted by that. And it just, you know, it does tales with whatever our personal history is and it makes it challenging to live right now. And I agree. What I'm trying to do in my own life, and also one theme that I've been using in a lot of my teaching, my writing teaching and my retreat teaching is how can we face grief and loss and really face the reality of our lives uh, and the uncertainty we, we all face and simultaneously seek joy? Can we have this experience of awe, mm. joy, pleasure, beauty? At the same time that we're not shut down to the incredible challenges we are all at this juncture. And, and I think a big key to that is understanding that we're not alone. Understanding that the same trauma that you're going through, somebody else has already experienced it and has been through it as well. And I think sometimes, and we're finally at our destination, so I'm going to get up and walk to a more stable place. But I think that <laughs> this is the first time I've done a podcast. Really like this <laughs> Wait, well, know, like it's, before the pandemic, this never would have happened, right? Oh, I know. In fact, it really is because of COVID that we're able to do these kinds of things. It's it's crazy to me to think that I even have a podcast to begin with. Number one, and then number two that I'm in London. Number three that I'm talking to you, who has experienced so much success in your life and so many accomplishments. And I'm just so honored to have the chance to talk to you, to be honest with you, because I do believe that what you're giving people is the language to heal and to navigate complex relationships. And that's yeah. something that, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say on my, on my website, I have a little tagline and it's healing words that change lives. And for me, like everything I've done in the last 35 years fits under that rubric, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. the seven books I've written or the teaching I do, um, it, it's all about using words um, and language to be able to heal, you know, both mm -hmm. ourselves. Oh, yeah, I agree with you. And I think that there's something that people have to hear and then once they hear that someone else has gone through it, then it, it helps you go, okay, it's not that bad for me because other people have gone through it and they found a way to work through those issues. And I want to know when you wrote The Courage to Heal, because that was the first book that you and your, your co-author put together. Were you scared? Were you scared like oh. that first? Oh my God, I was terrified. Uh, you know, I the courage to heal. Um, I'll just for those who are not familiar with the book, it, it was published in 1988, so it's 35 years ago, which just shocks me. Um, I started writing it as a 28 year old who had just oh, wow. reached my incest memories, and I teamed up with Ellen Bass, who is an extremely well known poet, but she was at the time teaching writing workshops for women and women were coming and, and writing these stories of having been sexually abused. And, and out of all of that, um, we wrote this book, The Courage to Heal, which was the first guidebook for survivors of child sexual abuse. And it, you know, up until that point, uh, the, the message basically was, this is extremely rare. And basically, if it happened to you, you're fucked. You know, right. Your life is ruined, basically. Right. Nobody was, was talking no, about that stuff back then. Nobody there, was. There was no pathway to healing. Like, okay, so yes, you had this trauma. And then people were, women were starting to break silence at that time and tell their stories. This was, you know, this is the, the precursor to the Me Too movement. This, this was the antecedent to that. Um, and it came out of the rape crisis movement and the battered women's movements and, you know, all the movements to empower the downtrodden, the gay rights movement, black power, mm -hmm. and all these movements to free people from oppression. And out of the, uh, the freeing up of women came this incredible movement. And our book was um, absolutely part of that lineage and that legacy. And, it, you know, it came out at a time when these issues were just beginning to be talked about. And it, it catapulted, it became this underground bestseller and took off 
and sold, you know, like a million and a half copies, way beyond anything we ever anticipated. And so as a very young woman, I was catapulted onto the national stage in the US um, at a time when I was still deeply immersed in my own healing process from the incest I'd experienced. You know, I wasn't, I had not integrated the experience. So I was really traumatized um, and I was going around getting on these stages where busloads of people would come hear me speak. Um, and so, so it was, and it was really um, in a way exhilarating, terrifying, and, and just so um, sad that it was necessary. Yeah. And, you know, while Ellen and I were writing the book, I was in a complete panic over how my parent, how my family would react, uh, especially my mother. Um, but I, you know, I just felt like my world was going to end and that I was going to lose my family. And that is what happened. You know, basically, I, I, I gained the world and lost my family. And particularly my mother's side of the family who you know, insisted I was a liar and I was now going on national TV and going on Oprah and spreading lies about my family. Um, and it was it was a very devastating experience to have that loss. And yet I knew I had to publish this book. I, I felt like it was it was in a way what I came on the planet to do was that bring that piece of work into the world and and change consciousness in that way. Um, and to be a part of that has just been an incredible honor. Um, but it also to be catapulted into the public eye for one of the very worst things that had ever happened to me um, was a pretty challenging experience, especially as a young adult. I, I wasn't really uh, primed. I didn't have the skills or preparation right. to really handle the kind of attention I got. I mean, everywhere I went, people would recognize me and they would start telling me their incest stories. And, and, you know, when that happens to you everywhere you go, like to the movie theater, to the bathroom in the movie theater. Oh gosh. It's, it, you know, it was just, I, it was just too much, you know, for me. Um, I and understand. Yet, all the years since then, the theme of healing and using language and story, I, I believe are when we tell our stories our real true stories, not the kind of, habitual story we tell the kind of surface story or cover story but when we tell the real truth and it is witnessed by a caring loving nurturing listener uh, who's not trying to fix us or change us or give us advice that experience of being listened to from that very place is utterly transformative i mean i've seen it for decades now and that's that's why i only teach in groups and why I love retreat teaching so much because the depth of the work that people can do and the healing they can do with each other, it's just, it, it's a, it's a miracle to witness. You know, it's just so, um, it's one of the things that makes me feel awe is when I see that kind of, I see someone walk in at the beginning of the retreat and they're scared and they're like, why did I sign up for this thing? <laughs> You're right. I think I want to leave or I'm not really a writer. You don't have to be a writer. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's the modality that we use. And then, I, you know, a week later or however long the retreat is, if it's international, it might be two weeks later, but local, it might be, you know, five days later, a week later, their face, their body is completely relaxed. They are laughing. They're connected. They're filled with love and a sense of possibility and and they've turned the pain they came in with and the isolation into possibility and also into community i mean i i i i am a writing teacher but what i really do is build communities healing communities mm -hmm. and that's what rocks my boat you know and it's 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 the gift i have is to be able to do that and i um i love watching it there's just nothing, there's nothing like it. It's, it's, you know, creativity is a, such a powerful tool for healing it. And we all deserve to tell our stories. We do. Yeah. So in the spirit of that, as I read your book, and maybe it's because I, I just don't know the first thing about memoir writing, and this might be good for my, for my <laughs> listeners as well. I don't remember what I had for breakfast three days ago. I don't remember the details about anything like Every all of my my traumatic memories are just snippets and they're jumbled up and I, I didn't keep journals all my life. Right. Um, 
I, and so I really only have those surface wave top stories. So for somebody who's who wants to share their story, I think that when you've been traumatized, it's it's all over the place. Right. And so how 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 does somebody start to piece that together when they're writing a story? Do they do they make up some of those details? I, I'm just I'm dying to know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of questions in your question. Um, I know. You know I know. A loaded I, question. Yes. The first thing I want to say is that um, you can't recover all your memories, and I don't think we should because there maybe are some things that like our our body wisdom at keeping us from certain information might be pretty smart because we're not really equipped or ready to handle it. Um, but my experience with writing is that it's, it's when you, it's like you cast a line into the water when you, the way I teach writing and the way people write in my classes, you don't, you don't, it's a process of exploration. In other words, you don't have the whole story in your head and then you record it. You, you use writing as a tool for excavation, as a tool for um, having open-ended questions um, as a as a way to discover um, details of your past, but also maybe attributing a different meaning to the past. So sometimes, you know, it's not that we still have to carry our stories and we still have to carry whatever's happened to us, but our perspective on it can change. And writing can really help us change our perspective um, and carry things maybe with more grace, with with less angst. Um, and with a little more freedom um, and compassion for ourselves. But I, I find that when you um, start writing about something, the more you write, the more you remember. So that's the first thing is that, you know, as you begin the process of writing, it, it's like you're opening a door and more starts to come back. And it doesn't come back like a linear movie or something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like that. And, and traumatic memory is broken just the way you were describing often. Um, but as people begin to write, um, more and more comes back. And then if you're in a writing circle and there are other people writing true stories about their lives, it may not be the same as your story, but the, the core emotions, the core human experiences are always going to be the same. And so you could be really moved by someone else's story and then you'll, you'll find yourself remembering more about your own experience. So just the way I teach writing, which is called writing practice, uh, which was developed by Natalie Goldberg in her book, Writing Down the Bones. Writing practice is an incredible way to retrieve memories that we don't have access to. Um, and the point is not just like, I have to remember, I have to remember. That doesn't really, it's almost violent to do that to ourselves. Um, but, you know, it's it's that that inquisitive, curious questioning of, you know, mm -hmm. And it's also, what are we ready to know right now? But as you write, you remember more. As you speak your stories, you gain the courage to remember more. Mm -hmm. um, and I always, especially if people are writing about trauma, it's really important to make, for me, like if I teach, I have a retreat um, in August this year. It's called Writing as a Pathway Through Grief, Loss, Uncertainty, and Change. And People come for a lot of reasons. They might come because someone has died. They might come because they're dealing with a diagnosis. They might come because they're a caregiver. They might come because their kids are leaving home and they're dealing with the empty nest or they're in some other kind of life transition. They just got a divorce or um, they're retiring or, um, you know, it could be any, and it could, or it could be they're feeling grief about the world. And they're, they're really struggling with, you know, how do I live my life when the climate change is happening? So it could be a whole range of things. And when people come in, um, often the thing they think they were going to work on is not what comes up during the course of the, the workshop. Um, and as people write more and more, you know, that they go deeper and deeper into that topic or theme or, or a subject that they are writing about. Um, and, and we write not just to uncover, but also to strengthen ourselves. So, you know, in the course of a workshop, I might, one of my favorite prompts this year um, has been, this is the way things are right now. And you just, you write that line and then you just write truthfully, this is what's happening right now. You know, and mm -hmm. it could be about, you know, I could say, this is the way things are right now. You know, the Tennessee legislature just kicked out two black freshmen, congressmen, you know, basically voiding democracy, 
this is the way things are right now, you know, or it could be, this is the way things are right now. I walk into the house and my two-year-old yellow lab comes bounding up to me and thrusts her nose between my legs for a pet, you know, and I put my hands in her warm fur and feel this incredible <laughs> connection to life. And I, I often, when I give that prompt, I encourage people to, to start with something challenging. This is the way things are right now. I was up at three in the morning, unable to sleep because of anxiety, you know, and you could go into that. And then the second time you do it, talk about, you know, the beauty of a plant that's growing in your backyard. So that you're, it's to, to help people understand that you could hold both. Mm -hmm. you don't just get to fix all the things that are hard and then have pleasure in life that we, we have to embrace joy and beauty wherever we are. So, you know, that's an example of the kind of prompts we do, you know, or, and then I might, you know, or it might be something like the prompt could be, I'm letting go of, and it's more like, it's like a manifesto of all the things you're going to let go of, or, you know, make a list of things you've lost. And it, it could be everything from like your purple jacket that you're still wishing you had after 15 years to your faith in democracy, you know, to, um, your belief in yourself as a good parent to, um, I, I lost my retirement or, you know, I just lost my best friend to an overdose. I mean, it could be anything. Right. The petty to the, the really profound. Um, and then as people begin to share, what happens is it just, every time someone shares something, it creates more space for someone to have the courage to write more of the truth. Um, I, I'm thinking about this, this one class, I was I have a Wednesday morning writing class. It met in person for many years. Now it meets on Zoom. And it's a writing practice class. And I've been teaching it for 25 years. And one day in that class, I don't remember what the prompt was, but I gave some kind of prompt. And one of the women um, who had been in the class for a long time, um, and I'd known her for years already, she wrote about her son being a heroin addict. And I knew that about her life, but no one in the class did because not for me to share. Mm -hmm. um, she wrote that story about her fear every time she went into his room, was he gonna be alive or dead? Um, and, and just about how incredibly difficult it was um, to be her, you know, and to, to have no control over her son's choices. Um, she read that and, you know, people were listening and holding the space for her to read that. There was this silence. And then we went on and someone else read something else. And then we took a break. We came back. And after the break, the very next prompt, two other people in the class wrote about members of their family with heroin. Yeah. And, and th their students I had had for a long time, and I didn't know that about their lives. But because the first woman had the courage to write that and to share it, it made it possible for that, that subject to then enter the room. Um, and, and I think it's important, I'm talking about some pretty intense things, but writing can also be an incredible way to gain strength. So I might, I might give the prompt something like, um, tell, tell me about, uh, make a list of things you're grateful for, or um, tell me, I want I do a meditation and bring people back into some moment of beauty and have them write about that moment of beauty, you know, or um, tell me about a time a stranger helped you or you helped a stranger or, or write about a moment of kindness you witnessed. So we can use writing both to strengthen us and develop inner resources, and also to excavate and heal. And so it's, it's, you know, what I love about writing is it's so accessible, you know, if you have a notebook and a pen, that's all right. you need. And I mean, I, I'm really a big believer in uh, writing in groups and being witnessed and, and the power of that container, rather than just always writing in your journal on your, you know, by yourself is really a different thing. Because then sometimes those stories, they fester in our notebooks, you know, and it, in a way that I always say that writing is the inhalation and reading out loud is the exhalation. And you really complete the circuit when you say the words out loud, even if it's only to yourself. Mm -hmm. There's something about taking our stories and giving voice to them that is a different level of breaking silence. We could still be very alone with our journal. Absolutely. And, and as I'm listening to you, the thing that comes to mind is the fact that anyone can do this. This isn't like 
something that is only reserved for people who say that they're artists. Right. Every, everyone has memories. Everyone has experiences. And the idea that you can get into a room and put your story out there and then hear other people relate to that story and then be motivated to then share theirs. It's, it's so powerful and it, it does, it helps people heal. I truly believe that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been witnessing that for a few decades now and, and um, I love it. I love it. I love, I love seeing it. And I love it when it happens for me, you know, I, I, I always try to make sure that I'm a writing student as well as a writing teacher. And um, I experience the same thing when someone else is holding the space and I'm just there to write. Um, you, you, you also, you, uh, back to the memoir, I just want to say that um, it took me 10 years to write The Burning Light of Two Stars. And I had to tell myself for the first nine years that I was not going to publish it. I never could have written it if I had been thinking about publication because once again, I was terrified of how my family would react because many of the people who had uh, cast me out of the family for the courage to heal decades earlier, I had reconciled with them to some degree, you know, I mean, sure. I never have like a holiday together where it wasn't stressful, you know, but cordial, not into, I, I don't have really intimate relationships with that side of my family at all, that they're not that kind of people, but, but I had, I had made peace and I just was, terrified that I was going to lose them all over again and that there was not going to be another 20 years to, you know, work it out. Um, and so that I felt like they were right there. So I had to tell myself, I'm not going to publish it. Um, and I actually waited until my mother died to publish the book and her whole generation, there were, she had a sister and brother-in-law in their eighties. Um, and I waited until they died before I published it. It just, I don't know. I just drew that line and then there's my generation, all my cousins, the ones who would be really upset. I just thought, well, I'm not going to wait to die because I won't be here anymore. Um, but I found in the process of writing that as I wrote it, it's not just that I remembered more. It's also that my relationship to my story kept evolving. Um, there's a quote in the front of the book by a former student of mine, um, the writer Deborah Fruche, And she said, Every time I look in the rear view mirror, the past has changed. And mm, you know, for me, that's, that's true. A powerful statement, because if you talk to me when I was 28 years old and writing The Courage to Heal, and you asked me who I was, I think I would have said I'm an incest survivor, period. Like that was the only identity. I was so huge in my life. That's mm -hmm. all that's in front of me. And, you know, if you were going to ask me today, who are you? You know, I would say, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. Um, I'm a teacher, I'm a workshop leader, I'm an author, um, I'm a mahjong player, I'm a hiker, I'm a swimmer, I'm a new dog owner, um, <laughs> I'm a cook, and I would, I would, it, being an incest survivor would not be on my list. And it's not like I'm denying what happened to me, but it feels like it's that trauma which was so present when I was first beginning to deal with it now feels like it's kind of like in the fabric of the cloth that shaped me. And it, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure it still has an impact on my nervous system. And when I'm in the most vulnerable places, there's probably aspects of it that still are impacting me. Um, but I just, it's so in the past. It, right. it's, and that's because I, you know, I really worked on it. It doesn't, it's not just time alone. Time alone does not heal trauma, you know. Um, but, you know, my perspective is different. My perspective on my mother is so different. You know, she right. was... She was like the evil queen to me uh, for much of my life. I saw her as like this larger than life demon, really, um, who was just <laughs> out to destroy me. That's how it felt. I felt so small in comparison to her awesome power, you know, and manipulation and all of that. And, you know, and then it changed over the course of her life and mine. Um, and then I, at the end of her life, I, I was her caregiver. And, yeah. and I had the power and she was needy and vulnerable. And that, that was such a, that's what my memoir is largely about. It, it just was something I never, ever would have anticipated. In fact, I remember saying to my brother at one point, uh, we were on a hike in Rocky Mountain National Park and we we're talking about what to do when our parents got old. And I said, I'll take dad, you take mom. I'm never <laughs> taking her, you know? And I, I ended up 
I ended up taking care of her and it was, um, it, it was a, a, one of the most transformative experiences I've ever had. Really challenging because I was triggered back into a lot of our old patterns from decades before. Um, and it, it was also just super hard being a caregiver anyway, but being a caregiver to a parent with whom you've had a, an ambivalent relationship at best or a parent who has betrayed you in the past is quite a challenging um, journey. Um, yeah. I, I definitely can understand that. I, I fear the same thing for myself. My, my mom and dad are in their 70s and their 80s and they're not getting any younger and uh, they really just have each other uh, at this point. And um, I have a very complicated relationship. My father was my first podcast guest, wonderful man. But my mother is uh, very much this, the way that you described your mother in some of the same dynamics. Um, I have the same sort of dynamics. We're both very strong-minded, strong-willed. And um, unfortunately, we've, we've had our, our share of, of, of conflicts over the years. And it's just this like unresolved issue. And I, and I fear the same thing that you, you talk about, Laura, that there's going to come a time that... Um, you know, my brother's not very stable and uh, I am more stable. So I, I fear the same things and, and I'm working on myself right now too in therapy to sort of process what, what I can on my end and, and my writing journey. And even this show, I, I say to people all the time that I, I basically started this show as my own therapy and to help others, of course. But um, the people who fascinate me and who speak to my soul are, are people that, I hope will help the collective, but I'm also doing it to help myself. And um, I hope that I can get to the place that, that you got with your mom, where it was this transformative experience, because yeah, I mean, I, it's not always going to be that way. You know, it's like, I, I'm not, I'm not here to um, promote the idea of some kind of sure the ending, you know, violins are playing and everything works out. I mean, <laughs> It, you know, if you read the memoir, it was a very complex experience and, and multi-layered and challenging and rewarding. It was not just, you know, like I said, just a happy ending, but it, I felt, I felt resolved when she died. I felt like we had worked, I had worked through, and I think we, but I had worked like, I felt clean. I didn't, I, I had I didn't have to carry anything about her going forward. Mm -hmm. Like I had done my work, I had I felt complete, and I think that's in some ways that's the best we could hope for. And you know, sometimes that completion may be uh, at a distance of thousands of miles from someone. As I said, some people are too toxic, um, and it's it's really not in our best interest. And I think it's important to feel. I I felt I had to make a choice about stepping into that role. Mm -hmm. If I like I had to, or I was forced to. Uh, that would have replicated dynamics that would have been very unhealthy for me. But I, you know, the, the opening, every, every, in terms of writing, every memoir, every story has what's called an inciting incident. It's like what kicks the story into motion and the protagonist then sets out on a journey, usually reluctantly and <laughs> obstacles, right? And we watch yeah, the hero's journey yep. for the hero or the heroine in this case. Mm -hmm. um, what was I going to say? Um, about the inciting moment and, and sort of what was yours? The inciting moment was um, I had just had breast cancer. That, that's kind of the opening of the book. I've just finished my treatment. I'm burning the notebook that had all the, from the Stanford Cancer Center. And it's like, I'm, I'm letting go of this. And I'm saying, I'm open to whatever comes next. <laughs> and, and that afternoon, my mother calls from 3000 miles away and says, I'm moving to your town for the rest of my life. She doesn't ask. She announces. No. She doesn't, does she? She announces I that. that. She, and that's and it and I um I, I guess I could have stopped her, but you know, it, I was very ambivalent because on one hand I felt like this is gonna destroy my life. She was already showing some early signs of dementia, but also just I felt like the only reason we had any success in our relationship is we had a three thousand mile buffer between us, which gave me a lot of control. And right. she, it's her moving to my I had moved three thousand miles to get away from her. And, you know, that was decades earlier. And so I was like, she's, this is going to uproot and destroy my entire life. And I'm, I'm not ready for this. I can't handle this. I can't handle this. But there was also a part of me that was like, we've, we've reconciled to this point of having some kind of relationship, one where I protected my inner self. I never shared anything vulnerable with yeah. her, but it was like, 
we could play cards together. We could hang out with the, her grandkids together, my kids. You know, we could celebrate a birthday together, or put on a dinner party. We do go to a play um, and talk superficially, but I was very protective. You know, like she was not in my inner world at all. I, I did not feel like that was safe. I didn't feel like she was safe. Um, but with these certain boundaries and that distance, we were able to have some kind of relationship. Um, and then when she said that, I, you know, I was like horrified and incredibly scared. But also there was a part of me that thought, can we resolve this relationship the rest of the way? Like, what would that be? And what does that look like? Yeah. What is that? What would that look like? And, and also what kind of daughter do I want to be? Mm-hmm. And I, so I really thought about it and, and that the part that wanted to see if it was possible and wanted to see if I could rise to this challenge, you know, went with a yes. Uh, and it was, it was a really difficult journey for me. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy I did it. And it's so interesting because she died eight years ago. And when I think about her now, it's with I, that thing about the, in the rear view mirror, things look different. Um, I, I look at her with so much love and mm-hmm. respect and, and really positive feelings. And I have a lot of her things around my house, like especially in the kitchen um, and some lamps. And I have a, a mirror in my living room that was hers. And I really like having her things around. And I feel much more honoring and aware of her positive qualities. And in, in some ways, and, and some of the positive aspects of the legacy she gave me, which was, you know, things like, she always had really, really good friends. And I've always had really, really good friends. Um, and a love of theater, um, a love of game playing. Um, and then there's some really negative qualities, like she was a compulsive doer, driven by, I think, anxiety, and I am too. And I, yeah. I'm really working on <laughs> trying to unhook that from my nervous system right now, but it feels like I got that from her. And maybe she, it's, I think it's through the generations, that kind of, um, it's like a deep anxiety. I'm Jewish. And I think it's, it's, part, <laughs> it's partly epigenetics. It's not, and it's partly her. And then that's partly the culture we live in and a lot of things. Um, but I, but I think of her much more with so much love and appreciation. And in part, I mean, I, this sounds really crass, but it's because she's dead. I mean, when someone has died in a way you get a freedom to work on the relationship on a very different level because you're not being triggered in the present. Right. You're it, not. There, you know, she's not going to hurt me. She's not going to say that thing that just triggers me every single damn time. Um, I, I don't, I, I just get to, um, I get to have the relationship on my own terms, in my own body, in my own mind, in my own psyche. And um, I really like, I, I feel like I have forgiven her. And I, I didn't, I haven't, that, I didn't set out to do that. That wasn't like my goal. I don't, I don't think forgiveness is like the ultimate thing in healing. But just as a natural result of all the work I did, I have really forgiven her and let go. Um, And I I have a lot of compassion. I think about, I think the other thing that helped me with her in particular, and maybe this would help with your own mom, is that at some point I was able to step back from the kind of intensity of the mother-daughter dynamic and my drama with her, which was very dramatic and very volatile. And I kind of go up to 30,000 feet and look at her life from a much vaster perspective. So, you know, I started looking at her childhood. Um, She grew up really poor uh, on the Lower East Side in New York City. Her parents were immigrants. um, And so she had that experience of poverty and also being the child of immigrants and um, feeling so much incredible shame about all of that. And, you know, my, her father, was my perpetrator. No, I mean, she never came out and she never acknowledged that. She she did sort of in that one scene that you describe in the book, she gave she you sort of, a, she a sort sense, of, a sort of a sense yeah, that she did. a sort of sense, but I never got the kind yeah. of acknowledgement I would have liked. And, um, you know, but when I looked at her life from a much bigger perspective um, and I saw she was the first, the only person in her family who ever went to college and had a professional career um, she traveled the world and, and had all these incredible adventures. Um, she was an actor and, and was in all these incredible plays and performances. And um, she, there were so many, quali- so many ways that she, as a woman of her generation, was extraordinary. 
But mm -hmm. I, I, all I could see was that she was my horrible mother who was consuming my whole life. And now I could see that it's not that those things didn't exist. I'm not in denial. I'm not sugarcoating. But, you know, there's a meditation I was doing the other day. Uh, the idea was that because I was dealing with a lot of anxiety was like, if you see your anxiety as a physical object, and then you, you, you put it in the corner of this very large warehouse that's empty, then it's not that the anxiety isn't there, but it's in this space that is much vaster. And that, that kind of visualization really helped me. And I think about my trauma in the same way. The trauma I experienced is still there. It's in that little corner of the uh, mm -hmm. warehouse, but I'm living in a warehouse that has much more space. So it's not yeah. like pushing it away or denying it or um, it, but it's, it's, creating a more spacious container. And I think that comes with, uh, for me, decades of work right. on myself and ongoing, you know. Absolutely. And I think that it's unrealistic to think when you've, you've been through any kind of trauma that it's going to be something that it's going to, you're going to go to a therapist and after a few sessions, you, you're going to walk out of there just fine. I, I think that if you understand that it's a constant process and you accept that there's never going in my mind anyway there's never going to be this moment where I say oh I'm fully healed and life is fine um, I, I do think though as I as I mature and as we all get older we, we should and can come to a place in our lives where it gets a little bit better and it just keeps getting yeah, a little bit better it can be a lot better, yeah. it can be a lot better. Um, and I think it's more cyclical you know and I there was a there's one story from the courage to heal and i did these interviews like i don't know more than 35 years ago and this woman really stands out to me and she was someone who went to a lot of like healing workshops and um you know was in therapy all the time and doing all these things to to, to fix herself right she said she went to mexico and lived there for a few months kind of off the grid what we would now say is off the grid mm -hmm. and she came back and she said her mail was full of circulars for all these self-improvement programs. And, and she just looked at them. She said, you know what? I'm good enough the way I am. Mm -hmm. And that always yeah. stayed with me. Um, and it's, it's kind of a paradox because I think on one hand, I believe in growing until I die. Like I'm committed to that. That's, that's kind of my core belief. Right. We grow until we die. I don't want to stagnate. And there's always an edge. One of the writing prompts I love is I'm standing on the edge of, because we're always standing on the edge. Like what, are, what is your edge right now? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. What's next? <laughs> achieving more intimacy in your marriage. Is it um, taking a risk in your business? Is it um, opening up and falling in love? Is it, um, you know, deciding to leave behind the identity of a career? Um, you know, what are you standing on the, you're on the edge of, you know, um, your child leaving home and giving up your identity, mm -hmm. the mother or whatever, as a, you know, as a primary identity. So we're always on the edge of something. And I think that standing on that edge, working on that edge is where we grow. Um, Absolutely. I, I believe it is too. And I think that like you said, there's going to be those times where you go, okay, I'm done sharing my story like you were with yeah. that one particular part of your story. And, and I've been talking about that with a lot of people that I think there comes that point where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm out of the short storytelling space on that issue. Time right. to move on and, and grow in another area. Yeah, so, I love that. You know, it's, it's something, it's something different that we need to move into. For people that want to know more about you, because I know we're getting kind of close to the end of our end of our hour, and I want to respect your time, but I do want to know how can people find out more about your website, your retreats, just overall your work. Okay, so my website is probably the best place, and it's lauradavis.net. That's easy. I really think anybody easy. can can lauradavis.net, and you'll find everything there. You can. Um, you could read the first five chapters of my memoir for free there. Um, and it also will tell you about my classes and workshops. And I've got a, a few, a couple retreats coming up that I'd like to talk about. Very different from each other, really for uh, people kind of at different points in their lives. Um, one is that about six weeks from now, 
um, I'm taking a group of writers to a villa in Tuscany. And um, I do a couple of these international trips a year. They're called Write, Travel, Transform. Um, and it's a, it's a combination of cultural exploration. And in Tuscany, we have like the most amazing personal chef on this incredible <laughs> villa with a pool and peacocks walking around and olive groves and um, grape arbors and just incredible history and beauty and yoga in the morning. And then we do, you know, a writing uh, class in the mornings. And then the afternoons we rest, we sit by the pool and then we go on some kind of outing. It could be a hike. It could be on a truffle hunt. We're going one day to Sting's <laughs> Villa. <laughs> he lives, lives nearby. Oh, how cool. And then in the evening we, you know, we gather at this incredible outdoor table that's set with yellow and white tablecloths. And we have this like three or four course feast under the stars with like long leisurely conversations. We did this last year and it was incredible. So um, that's, we're leaving, it's in, it's like the third week in May um, in, into the beginning, like to the end, the last two weeks in May basically. And we still have a couple of spaces left on that trip. And if the idea of a, a vacation that integrates, you know, adventure, um, Italy, incredible food, amazing <laughs> companions, um, some writing, um, which really helps bond the group. Um, you know, you please check that out. Um, and that's, that's at lauradavis.net forward slash Tuscany. Um, and if you just go to my website, you'll, you'll find it at yep. lauradavis.net. The other retreat I'm doing in the next few months um, is the one I was describing a little bit earlier in the show, which is um, it's called writing as a pathway. And it's about, it's really for people who are in transition, um, who are grieving some kind of loss. It doesn't have to be a death. It could be anything. Um, or people who, sometimes people come, they're just at a point in their lives where there's that deep inner urge of like, my life is feeling stale and I need something else, but I don't know what it is. And, and just that, that kind of very painful times of limbo when we're in between one life and we've outgrown it, but we don't know what's next. And we're, we're living with so much uncertainty. Um, you know, people come, as I said before, because their kids are leaving home and they're like, who am I now? Um, for a lot of different reasons. And that retreat is a week long retreat. It's the first week in August. It's um, in Watsonville, California, in Northern California at a beautiful retreat center on a mountain that's surrounded by redwood trees. Oh, and wow. I always like to teach in a beautiful place because it, it creates such a great container for this kind of deep work. Um, and that, that, that retreat is, uh, it's just such a sacred, incredible space and such a deep community forms during that week. And, you know, there's often tears, there's often lots of laughter um, and just a feeling of people come in feeling isolated and maybe really alone. And like, I'm the only one having these experiences and right. they're feeling deeply connected deeply seen, deeply heard, and with a sense of, as I said before, turning whatever pain they're carrying into a possibility for a future that they can begin to envision. I love it. So anyway, that that's on there too. And that you could look at that. That's lauradavis.net forward slash grief. Um, and I'd love to have you join me at, at either one of those. Um, to have. You don't, I just, to stress, you don't have to consider yourself a writer. I mean, this is not about performance. It's not about critique. It's not about publishing. It's really about using writing as a tool for, for healing um, and connection with right. self and others. Yeah, it sounds so amazing. And if I wasn't traveling so much for the Navy right now, I would definitely uh, look into it at this time. But I do hope that people who are listening to this call go on your website at lauradavis.net and take a look at these amazing opportunities. Because like I say, I don't think that writing is something that's out of reach for any of us. And it just starts with being able to be open and to let those memories and, and those things come, come in. So Laura, I want to thank you so very much for taking the time to do this in, in this most unusual way, but uh, <laughs> it did work. <laughs> thank you. And, I, I, you're a good interviewer and I, you know, it's just an interview. It's just a conversation and, um, I like the feeling of like, we're just having this intimate conversation about very real things, but there's a lot of other people listening. 
<laughs> at the yes. same time. That's always kind of fun to, to just be sitting in my office having this conversation with you. I know. That's how I feel too, Laura. And uh, yes, I, I'm very grateful for the platform that I've, I've been able to create online and the most amazing uh, viewers and listeners who, who continue to tune into the show. You're, like I said, my 82nd guest. I still can't believe I've gotten up 82nd. Yeah, congratulations. But, That's wonderful. But it's a, uh, it's a labor of love and uh, something I'm, I'm very proud to be doing. So with that, uh, I'm going to go to full screen here in just a minute. I think I've got to mess around with my, with my layout dark, here. Dark where you are. <laughs> I know it is starting to get a little dark. I'm about to, uh, to go out to eat here. But listen, Laura, thank you so much. I, I so appreciated this. And uh, I just, uh, I'll meet you backstage in just a second. And I'm going to go on full screen. But thank you very much. Bye, everybody. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Oh, my husband's putting on a little light there so you all can see me for a second. Um, thank you so much for this amazing hour. I hope that you've got some goodness from this. I know that I did, and uh, I'm just feeling so good, and I hope you are too. Um, I'll be back uh, with you all next week. Uh, it'll be the regular Sunday time for next week, but uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your weekend. Happy Easter. Almost forgot to say happy Easter. And uh, thanks, Heidi, for joining me. I know that there was Iron was on here. A few others were on here. And I do apologize. I didn't get to all the comments. B was on here from YouTube. So thank you, everyone. Have an amazing, amazing evening. And I'll talk to you all later. Bye now.